name is Itamar. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about Docker packaging, in particular, a best practices process for Docker packaging uh, with a focus on Python, since it's a Python conference, and a focus on production because Docker packaging is quite complex. Uh, and so you can't really um, cover everything in the context of one talk, or as we'll see in a second, uh, even within this limited scope, it's hard to cover everything. So before going into the bulk of the talk, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about why Docker packaging is complicated. And there's two reasons. And the first reason has to do with history. Docker packaging is at the intersection of a number of technologies some of which uh, have built on literally 50 years of software development, going back to Unix de developed starting in around 1970. So Unix signals were developed in 1970s uh, and they do affect how you do Docker packaging today. If you want clean shutdown, you have to deal with Unix signals. And that's the design decision that was made before I was born. Um, and then over the years, a whole bunch of different technologies have accumulated and uh, sort of some with good design decisions, some with some people sometimes make mistakes, even really great programmers. And, and once you've been using a system for 10 years, you can't just fix those things. Um, software changes, uh, there's new versions, and all of these different technologies intersect in one place in Docker packaging for Python. Uh, and you have to get them right. Uh, and so to just all that inter all those interactions, all those technical decisions end up in one place and it gets complicated. The second reason is not so much about Docker specifically and more about pack packaging. Uh, and packaging is at the intersection of a whole bunch of different organizational processes. Uh, you have someone who's writing software and you have to test your software, you deploy your software, um, you might want to have bug reporting, uh, you have to do upgrades, and all of these different organizational processes which might involve different people, different teams, but certainly just happen in different times and have different requirements. All of these different processes interact and converge in packaging, in this case, Docker packaging. And so again, all of these different things that you have to deal with add more complexity. And so the combination of these two things sort of history and all the different technologies and the combination of processes means Docker packaging is more complex than you would think it should be. As a result, it is not really feasible to teach you all the details about how to do Docker packaging with all the best practices in one 40 minute, 45 minute talk. Uh, I've been, you know, spent a few years sort of gathering different best practices specifically for Python, specifically for production. There's many more if you expand the scope. Uh, and I can think of at least 70 um, that I've come up with uh, and I keep adding more to the list. I can't really cover all that in one talk. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn a process, how you should go about it, how you can organize your work. And this process is driven by a few things. First, you have limited time on your job. There are many things you're doing and Docker packaging is probably just one of them. So at any time there might be like some critical bug you have to go fix, colleague you have to go help, some other task, uh, something becomes higher priority. And so the task of taking your application packaging in for Docker is a thing that you, you can't spend infinite amount of time on. You have a limited amount of time and you might be interrupted. In addition, as I said, there are many best practices. Uh, and it's not clear which ones you should do first, which ones are more important, which ones are less important. And so what you need, and what I'm going to cover in this talk, is an iterative process for docker dockerizing your application. So we'll start with the most important parts. And then each step builds on the previous step. And then if you're interrupted at any point, at least you've prioritized the really important things first. And uh, you've left the less important things for later. So if you run out of time, you've at least done the high priority first parts first. And here's an overview of the process. And the rest of the talk is going to be organized using these six steps. Uh, for each of the steps, I'm going to be sharing some examples. 
I'm going to go over these examples very briefly because they are just examples. Uh, and the important part is the pro overall process. Um, but uh, at the end of the talk, I will give a link to a bunch of articles I've written, which cover many of these uh, best practices in much more detail uh, and other resources to get you like underst understanding in more depth. The important part is sort of getting a sense of the, pr the process overall and what you should prioritize and what to start with and what to do next. And this process is fairly generic. Uh, it may not apply for everyone in all situations. For example, uh, in some cases, reproducibility of your packaging might be um, critical to your particular domain. And so you might decide to prioritize this first, that first, even though in this generic process, it's step five. Uh, but overall, this is my uh, attempt at a generic process that will work for most people most of the time. And the, it's useful to, to have this concept of, you know, here's what we should do first, here we should do next, and here's what we should do last, because given this many best practices, it's easy to get distracted and say, oh, my image is two gigabytes, that's way too large, I need to spend some time making it small. And it's true that a two gigabyte Docker image is typically way too big and you can make it smaller, but if you haven't thought about security, then you should probably spend some time thinking about security before you make your image smaller. Uh, and so eventually you should get to all of these steps, but the order does matter because you might run out of time. And so if you do, you wanna make sure you prioritize the really important things. So these are six steps. And as I said, we'll go through them one by one throughout the rest of the talk. So the first step is just get something working. Your goal is to take your Python application and make it run uh, via a Docker image. And if your application isn't running, it doesn't matter how secure or small or fast the image is, your image is useless. Like having your application run is sort of a minimal requirement for doing anything like, um, after that. And this is a really simplistic Docker file uh, as we'll cover in, uh, later on. It has some issues, um, but it will, for this application, run it. It will copy the files in, install your code, and then when you run the image, it runs the run server script. Um, and so something like this is going to be necessary before you do anything else. And because your goal here is just to get something minimally working, the things I'm talking about as best practices are in some sense more like requirements. If you don't do them, your application isn't running. And again, uh, I'm gonna go through some examples, but they're just examples. This is not at all a complete set of best practices. There are many more, I'm just lacking time. I'm just giving some examples. So the first example of something you need to do when you're doing your initial packaging is listening on the right interface. Uh, if you listen on 127.0.0.1 or loopback interface, uh, that's localhost inside the container. And just like localhost on my computer is not the same as localhost in your computer, localhost inside a container is not the same as localhost on your host machine. Um, and so if you listen to 127.0.0.1, your web application say, it will not be possible for anyone to connect to your server, you'll get a connection refused error. So what you wanna do is if you're running a web server for, for example, you need to listen on 0.0.0.0, which means all interfaces, including external interfaces, so that your server is accessible and you don't get a connection refused error. Uh, another example of a best practice, if you're writing a shell script uh, to drive your packaging or as your entry point, uh, make sure you use uh, so-called strict mode. Uh, there's a bunch of options you want to add at the top of every single bash script. It'll make it less broken. By default, bash will uh, just keep running in the face of errors. Like if you mention a variable that doesn't exist, it will say, fine, I'm just going to keep going. If your uh, sub-process fails, it doesn't care. I'll just keep going. And so your script can be doing things that are completely unexpected, where in Python, it would throw an exception stop. Um, so at the top of every bash script you should have these three options and you'll see that in some of the examples later on. So first step, as I said, as we've seen is to get your a basic Docker image that runs your application. So that's a prerequisite for doing anything else. So once you've done that, 
the next step is to think about what you need to do to run this Docker image somewhere that's not your own personal computer. And if you're gonna be running anything publicly, it needs to be secure. Uh, even if it's not deployed into production, even if it's just a staging environment, uh, if it's accessible to the, to the internet at large, it can be attacked, someone can take it over. They might get your computing resources. They might be able to uh, sort of escalate outside of the container and into the host machine. And so and if your container is going to be running publicly, most of the end, like a web application, um, then it need, you need to spend some time thinking about security. And so that's why this is step two. If your container will only ever be running on your own personal computer, maybe you don't care about security, but typically security should be the next step after making something working. So here's an example of a security best practice. When you run a Docker image and start up a container, the default is that the processes inside that container will run as root. And a container is in some sense a restricted runtime environment. Uh, it is isolate, isolated in many ways. Uh, the run, container runtime can put additional restrictions on how that process runs. But even with all of that, running as root means your process has more permissions than it would otherwise have. And that means if an attacker takes over your process, uh, if an attacker um, somehow manages to get into your container uh, and start having your program do things you didn't expect, they'll have an easier time escaping from your container to the wider system uh, if you're running as root. And so a good security best practice is to make sure all your container images run your application as a non-root user. So in this example, we're running this shell command to create a new Linux user. We're using this Docker file command to say that all subsequent copies and runs and entry points should be as that user. And then for later commands, uh, both during the build packaging and during when the container starts up will run as that non-root user. And so your container will inherently be more secure. So it's just a few lines in your Docker file and it's just always a good idea to do if you can. Another uh, example of a security best practice is installing uh, updated system packages. So in this example, we're using uh, this base Docker image as the basis for uh, your Docker image. And you would think that uh, these images uh, would have all security updates installed in them. And they do get updated on a fairly regular basis, but they do not actually have all security updates. It is possible that this base image right now uh, is missing some security updates that uh, have been released by, in this case, Debian. Uh, and so in every Docker file, uh, you should, as part of building it, uh, run the relevant commands to install security updates for your system packages. So libc, OpenSSL, and so on. In this case, since it's a Debian-based Docker image, we'll use apt-get update and apt-get upgrade. Uh, if you're using a Red Hat-based system, based system, you'd use DNF or yum. Uh, and so just taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture, so far, all the examples we've looked at have involved uh, working on your configuration files, your scripts on artifacts, your Docker file. Uh, and so packaging does involve a lot of work of like, creating artifacts that are configured correctly, making sure your startup scripts are correct, making sure your Docker file is, cor is correct. But packaging also requires ongoing processes. Uh, writing, the art, like writing a good art Docker file is a thing you do once. You're not gonna touch it very much after, once you're done. But to have a uh, soft, your, your software packaged correctly, you need ongoing organizational and technical processes that will basically continue forever so long as the software is deployed and are not tied to the initial packaging phase. So for example, uh, security updates are a thing where you need an ongoing process. It's not just about the initial image. It's a thing you have to keep doing pretty much forever. A Docker image is an immutable artifact. Once you've created a Docker image, you cannot change it. It's unchangeable by definition. And in many ways, that's a good thing. What that does mean is when you have a 
uh, security problem with one of your dependencies. So Django has a security update, OpenSSL has a security update. You're going to have to create a new image with the new version of Django or the new version of OpenSSL. What that means is you need an organizational process where you learn about security updates. You learn about the fact that some of your dependencies are vulnerable. You update them if necessary. So you might have to change your requirements at text. You rebuild your image, and then you redeploy your application if relevant. If it's a batch job, you don't have to redeploy, but for a web server, you'd have to redeploy it. And so this is an ongoing process. You can't just do this once. You have to do this forever. Uh, and so just keep in mind that packaging is not a one-time thing. It is a thing you have, you're going to have to keep working on smaller scope, but you can't just never think about security updates. So, so far we've covered the first two steps of the process. Step one was just getting something working. Step two is making your image secure. And so once your image is at least minimally secure, you can start thinking about uh, running it uh, publicly rather than just on your own laptop or your own desktop. And so at this point, you don't want to manually be running uh, builds for your image. Uh, probably not working alone. You're probably not working along alone. You have teammates. They also want to build images. Um, you might want to build images and pull requests, things like that. And so the next step is to start building these images automatically. So in your CI system, your build system, start actually building these images and storing them somewhere, or maybe even deploying them if you're doing continuous deployment. So here is a sort of minimal shell script that shows what a really minimal uh, automated build might look like. You show this in your CI system. Uh, so we have the uh, thing we put at the top of all bash scripts, run our tests, we build the image, we push the image to an image registry. So this is sort of the minimal, simplest possible automated build. But if this happens automatically, then uh, anyone who does an automated build will get a Docker image built automatically. And again, this is uh, this automated build is a thing you have to think about as integrating your current development processes. It's not just about creating the artifacts, it's about looking at the bigger picture. Packaging interacts with the way you develop code. So for example, are you gonna run tests before you do the packaging? Uh, are you gonna use this Docker image to do some integration tests? Are you gonna do both? Uh, how are branches gonna be dealt with? Do you want a Docker image for each branch? And we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, is packaging going to be a bottleneck for your developers? Like if, if it turns out that right now your Docker build takes an hour, maybe you wanna prioritize speeding up the build, even though in the general process, I typically suggest doing at the end. So since you're integrating with automated builds, you have to start thinking about the bigger picture of how is this interacting with your uh, general development processes. So one example of a best practice you can do as part of your builds is running security scanners. Uh, you should have, there are ways to get notified proactively about security problems. Uh, so for example, GitHub Actions can, uh, GitHub Actions, uh, GitHub can scan your application and like open pull requests or notify you when your Python dependency has a security problem. But if you wanna do a built in suspender sort of thing, you can um, use a tool like Trivi which will scan your Python dependencies and system packages and tell you if there are any known security issues. Uh, so you can run it against your Docker image and it'll say, you know, you're writing an insecure version of OpenSSL. Uh, all of these tools, GitHub's notifications, uh, Trivi scans, are only help you with the known security vulnerabilities in your dependencies. They won't help you with your code. Uh, so there's tools like Bandit that will actually scan your Python code and point out things that might be security vulnerabilities. For example, uh, it might be able to spot a SQL injection uh, bug in your code. So just useful things to have as part of your automated build system. Another useful thing to have is to build an image for every branch. Um, if you look at our original build script here, uh, we're just giving uh, the image the same name each time when we build it. And it's common in uh, many software projects to have uh, feature branches. So you have inch issue 123, someone asks you to add more cowbell. So you open a branch, uh, implement the feature, open a pull request, 
Uh, and you may want to build a Docker image at that point. For example, maybe you're running tests with your Docker image, or maybe you want to do manual testing. So if you just always give your Docker image the same name and then push it to an image registry, then your Docker image from your branch will overwrite the Docker image you deploy to production. And you don't want that because this is a work in progress. So what you can do is you can modify your build script uh, as in this example to name your images uh, based, for example, on your Git branch. So in this case, uh, we run a little command to get the name of the current branch. And then when you build the image, the part after the colon is named after your branch. So you'll have your image colon main for your main branch, and then your image colon one, two, three, more cowbell for the cowbell feature branch. And so different people can build images in parallel and they don't stomp at each other. Uh, another thing you might want to do when you're automating builds is take some steps to make sure that your builds are fast. Docker, when you rebuild an image, will see if you have a previous build, uh, or you can more explicitly point it at a cache, and it will say, oh, this part of the build hasn't changed, so I can just reuse that. And then when you do a rebuild, it will just rebuild faster because it doesn't have to do all the work every single time. That only works if Docker actually knows how to uh, find that, that previously built image layers if it has some access to an existing cache. If you're building on your desktop machine, this happens automatically. If you're building on CI, you're often starting with a completely empty VM. So GitHub Actions deploys a completely new virtual machine each time. In GitLab CI, it's deploying a completely new Docker container typically each time. And so you have to take some steps in your build script to warm up the cache to make sure it knows how to find uh, the previous data. And there's a little song and dance you have to do, uh, which I'm not going to go into for lack of time, but um, there are articles on my website. And again, at the end of the talk, I will direct you to my website with a lot more detail about many of these best practices. So caching is great because it speeds up your builds. The problem with caching is it also uh, means that, for example, when you uh, run apt get upgrade to install security updates, when you do another build, if caching is working, it won't actually run the apt get upgrade. Uh, Docker will say, oh, this has this command hasn't changed, so I can use the cache version. And so it'll just skip installing the security updates. And so to uh, get past that, you have to do a, a Docker builds with dash dash no cache to tell it to rebuild from scratch. And in general, because system packages can just get security updates. If you're relying on apt get upgrade to uh, install your security updates and you're not deploying automatically on a regular basis, you're not going to get security updates being pushed into production. So it's good practice to once a week, once a day, depending how paranoid you are, to rebuild your image from scratch and then redeploy, just to make sure that things like OpenSSL and libc security bug fixes get redeployed. So you've got your image working, step one. Step two, you've made it secure. Step three, you've automated the builds and made it even more secure. And so at this point, you're building lots of images. You're probably deploying to production. Um, and you have more images. You have errors. You have just, you have all this stuff happening uh, in the real world. And you want to sort of have a better understanding of what's going on. You want your image, to, your containers to run better. Uh, so this point, we're moving away from sort of minimal criteria and more towards just making things easier to debug, easier to understand, make them run better rather than run at all. So for example, um, if you have a bug in your Python code or something unexpected happens, you'll get a trace back. And if it's not handled, the exception isn't handled, that trace back will go to the logs. And then those logs are a thing you can read. Maybe you're using a third-party service like Sentry uh, or one of its competitors to keep track of all those exceptions. That's great. You can track it, keep track of errors and fix them. If you have a bug in your C code, your process will segfault. Uh, and Python itself is written in C. Many of the libraries you're writing or you're using are written in C. And so segfaults do happen. Uh, and Quite often, you just get no information. Just your application crashed. You have no idea why. Uh, you may not have access to the core file. And so this is going to be quite difficult to debug. However, Python has a really neat feature that's built in called Fault Handler. 
And basically, if you set uh, an environment variable, uh, Python, fight, Python fault handler, you set it to one, then you will also get tracebacks uh, from when you have a seg fault in your C code. And so instead of just this silent crash, you'll get a traceback saying, oh, you are calling this command in, I'm not saying this is a particularly buggy library, just an example, but you were calling this command in matplotlib and here's a traceback of what you did. That makes it much, much easier to reproduce because you know exactly which library was the problem. You know what Python code you were calling, you know what function you were calling. And so it's much easier to create a reproducer and fix a problem or file a bug upstream. So all you have to do is just add this one line to your Docker file and you will get much better errors if you have a C crash. Another thing you might wanna do is make it easier to identify your images. Like if you're building images on every pull request or on every commit to your main branch, uh, you're gonna have a bunch of images. It may not be clear which image exactly is running in production or what image someone's testing with. And when you create an image, you give it a name, the, the tag, uh, but the tag is not actually embedded in the image itself. And so given an image, you don't actually know what the, uh, what the original tag was. But there is a thing called labels, which are embedded into the image itself. So given a Docker image or a Docker container, you can inspect it and get the label, which is in the actual metadata for the image and gets distributed with the image. Uh, so when you do a Docker build, you can use a dash dash label arguments to add labels and a uh, useful thing to do is to use the git branch and git commit used to build the image as labels uh, so that you can so see exactly which code was used to create a particular image. Uh, another useful thing to do is to run a smoke test as part of your automated build. Uh, your unit tests check your code on the low level. You might have integration tests that check the system as a whole. Uh, and those will probably use a Docker image. But if your Docker image is broken, your unit tests happen before then, and your integration tests will fail, but they'll fail slowly in a somewhat obscure way. So like after 10 minutes, you might get a test timed out with connection refused error or something. So it's nice to know that uh, as soon as possible if your Docker packaging is broken. So you can write a simple smoke test uh, to see just minimally if your Docker packaging is it, which will catch if your Docker packaging is completely broken. So for example, you have a web application, you start it up, uh, send an HTTP query, shut the image down, container down. Uh, that won't catch all packaging problems, but it will catch sort of blatant ones. And so at least you'll tell much earlier in the testing process if your Docker image is broken compared to integration tests. Uh, another example of the best practice, if you're using GeoUnicorn, um, GeoUnicorn, um, has his heartbeat, which it communicates via file. That file is typically in slash temp. Uh, if slash temp is on a disk, then uh, the disk writes might be slow and that can make uh, Geonicorn just freeze. Uh, this is especially a problem in cloud environments uh, where the disk might actually be a remote disk. And so if you're using Geonicorn and Docker, you want to use this option uh, to tell it to instead of uh, keeping this file on disk to keep it in shared memory. Uh, and this is just an example of the complexity I talked about of all these different interacting technologies. Uh, Geonicorn sort of assumes it's running on a standard Linux distribution where slash temp is an in-memory file system. It's not the case in Docker. And so these two sets of assumptions clash and you have to use a special option. Uh, and so this is a more general problem of uh, the runtime environment that Docker provides may not be exactly the same as the runtime environment that your software expects. Uh, and so you sometimes have to deal with that. Uh, if you want your Docker container to shut down cleanly, you have to do some stuff so that signals get delivered correctly. So you should always use the square bracket syntax for entry point. Uh, if you're running a shell script, the last command should always have exec so that the Python process subsumes the shell script and is in a, a, a sub-process. I won't go into too much details. It's just, you have to use the syntax or shutdown might take 10 seconds instead of shutting down immediately. 
So those are some examples of things you can do to make your software, uh, your packaging uh, easier to debug, easier to identify, work better in production. And so um, next step at this point is to think about reproducibility. Like you've spent maybe a day or two uh, on Docker packaging. And during that time, the packages you depend on haven't changed. Um, so if you're writing like a pandas program, um, if you install pandas today, install pandas tomorrow, it's probably the same version. Uh, over the course of six months, your dependencies are going to change out from under you. Not all of them, some of them. There might be a new major release of pandas. There might be a new release of Python. Uh, if two years pass, then pretty much everything you depend on will have changed. So next you want to start thinking about how to make your images reproducible so you can update your dependencies in a controlled manner. And reproducibility, reproducibility is a thing you have to think of in terms of, the, of a process and an ongoing process. So if you install your, the latest dependencies of your application and every time you rebuild your Docker image, then you have no reproducibility. So if you install just Pandas or Jenga with no version specified, you install today, install in three months. In three months, you might get a different version. And that different version may act differently, may have different bugs, may have different features, may be backwards incompatible. So what you want to do is you want to freeze all your dependencies so that when you, you always install the same version each time. At that point, every time you rebuild your Docker image, you'll install exact same dependencies. The problem is, as time passes, these dependencies will become obsolete. Um, so for example, you'll start missing security updates, but more broadly, at some point, you'll be using software that isn't supported anymore even. It's like a long-term support release that some software provides is nice. For example, Django has long-term support uh, version 2.2. But Django 2.2 will end updates, security updates in April 2022. So if you're depending on it um, in about a month, uh, you will no longer be able to get security updates. And so you need this ongoing process to update your dependencies. So in the short term, you want to always be installing the exact same thing. In the medium and long term, you want to be updating the, your, your dependencies uh, so that you are getting security updates and so you're not using obsolete versions. One example of best practice, uh, when you're choosing a base image uh, for your Docker file, uh, you should use something that is based on a Linux distribution that doesn't change too often. You don't want major changes happening to you without expecting that. So you want something like Ubuntu long-term support, Debian stable, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Oracle Linux, if you want a Red Hat clone. Uh, I like to use the official quote, um, Docker Python images, uh, which are based on Debian stable, but give you access to all the different versions of Python. So for example, Python colon 3.10 slim bullseye means Python 3.10, latest point release on Debian 11 uh, code name bullseye. So latest stable version of Debian Linux. Uh, and the slim means a smaller version. Uh, so you get smaller images. And so if you choose a stable base image, then everything will be backwards compatible, but you'll get security updates to your system packages. Uh, as I said, you want your Python dependencies to be pinned to specific versions. And so for example, uh, pip tools has a tool called pip compile. It'll take a requirement file that looks like this and pin it to specific versions like that. Um, and you pip env, uh, if you use it or poetry, do the same thing. Uh, and the idea is that way, whenever you install your software, you're using the exact same versions all your direct dependencies, but also all of their dependencies. So for example, Django depends on ASCII ref. So we want to make sure we also get the same version of ASCII ref each time we install. Uh, although again, we need the process to continuously update these over time. So those are were some examples of reproducibility uh, best practices. And at this point, um, our Docker image is basically done in some sense. We still need those ongoing processes to keep it working, but the, the, the artifacts themselves are, are fairly stable. We've made it work, we've made it secure, we made it run well in production, we've made it reproducible. But at this point, there's still one more thing we might wanna focus on, which is making your software run faster. Um, your time is expensive. Uh, 
compute time and bandwidth might also be expensive or might be uh, that you, know, you, you need just to have things uh, start up quickly. And so it's typically worth uh, spending a little bit of time optimizing how long it takes to build your Docker image and how big your Docker image is uh, so that your team is more productive. So you're not spent wasting time wait, uh, waiting 30 minutes every time you do a pull request for your Docker image to build, which can happen. So one example of a performance best practice uh, for to speed up your Docker image builds is don't use Alpine Linux. Most of the pre-compiled wheels that you can download from PyPI um, don't work on Alpine. The situation is getting better. Uh, it is now possible to distribute wheel binary wheels that uh, work in Alpine, but many packages don't. And so the end result is that when you install packages on Alpine Linux, you have to compile them from scratch. So if you install, I, I did a test a while ago, if you install pandas and matplotlib on the Debian-based Docker image, uh, there's pre-compiled binary, so it just took 30 seconds, which is basically just downloading the packages. On Alpine, at the time, there were no packages. And so you had to install a compiler, install a bunch of libraries, and you had to run a compiler, compile all these packages and all their dependencies. And so it was like 50 times slower. Uh, that's 5,000%. Like it, it just took immensely more time to, to do Docker packaging. And it's true that caching does help with this. Uh, you don't have to do this every time, but it's just, there's also just a time of making the compilation work. It's just really not worth doing. Uh, you can get pretty small images without Alpine Linux. I just recommend against using it. There's really no reason to use it if you're a Python developer. Uh, you want, in order to get faster builds, you want to structure your Docker file to take advantage of Docker caching. Um, basically, uh, as soon as one of these steps in the Docker file gets invalidated, all later steps have to be rerun. So in this example, we're copying in the requirements at text and then installing GCC. What that means is if the requirements at text changes and we have to reinstall GCC. The problem is that GCC doesn't actually depend on requirements at text anyway. Requirements at text is only needed for pip install. And so every time we add a new Python dependency or change our Python dependency as we are reinstalling GCC, we can't take advantage of caching, it's a waste of time. So we wanna move the copy so it happens right before the run command that actually uses it. Just copy files in only when you actually need them, which improves caching for previous layers. And that will speed up your rebuilds. Uh, similarly, uh, if you just do pip install uh, on a setup.py that has a bunch of dependencies, Every time your code changes, you have to reinstall all your dependencies. You have to rerun pip install of Django or Pandas or whatever it is you're using. So if you have your dependencies and requirements that text, which you install separately, uh, you can just copy only those in, install your dependencies, then copy in the rest of your code, and then copy and install your code. And that way, you again, you get, take better advantage of caching, and your rebuilds are faster. When you install system packages, uh, by default, often de uh, extra dependencies will get installed that are recommended, but not necessary. So for example, on Debian-based or Ubuntu-based systems, you can do dash dash no install recommends and it'll install the system packages. When you install pip packages with pip, it will typically keep a file, a copy of the downloaded file uh, in a cache directory. So you don't have to re-download it if you reinstall it later in a different virtual env. Um, and so if you're doing the development in your local laptop, that's great. It means you don't have to install another 600 megabytes uh, when you create a new, download another 600 megabytes when you install, create a new virtual env and uh, data science packages are often really that big. Uh, if you're creating a Docker image, you're only ever going to install the package once. You're never gonna reinstall it. Uh, and so you can just tell pip not with the dash dash no cache near option not to cache files and the result will be uh, your Docker image will be smaller. And again, those are just examples. There are many more best practices I didn't go over. The really important uh, takeaway here is that you should uh, prioritize your tasks, prioritize the packaging uh, in an order that makes sense so that if you have to stop partway, uh, you 
don't aren't left with an insecure image, for example. So you start with getting something working, move on to security, make builds automated, improve uh, the way it works in production and make it easier to debug, make your builds reproducible, and then work on optimization. Again, this is a generic order. In your particular case, you may choose to do things in a different order, but this is a good starting point for most people. And the other big takeaway uh, is that packaging isn't just about creating a Docker file. It's not just about creating build scripts. Those are all things you have to do. They're all necessary. There's also, packaging is also about uh, creating processes. You need a process for security updates. You need a process for dependency updates. And it's also uh, something where you can't just go and do it. You have to think about how it integrates with your other development processes. You have to think about how it'll interact with pull requests. You have to think about how it interacts with branches, version control, testing. Uh, so when you're starting on packaging your application, you should spend some time thinking about how it's going to interact with all the different stages of your software development, software deployment, software distribution, uh, because this is going to impact how you do packaging, what you're going to prioritize. So that's my talk. Um, there's a couple of links here. Uh, if you just go to pythonspeed.com, it's my main website. There's a bunch of articles about Docker packaging, uh, performance optimization, uh, reducing the memory uh, if you're running large batch jobs, write about that too, Got some tools for that too. There's a prose version of this talk. It focuses less on the specific examples and more about the overall process. And I have lots and lots of articles uh, covering uh, various specific best practices for packaging. And if you want even more, uh, I have a book you can buy, uh, but there's a huge number of free articles on the website there uh, that cover each of the, many of the best practices I talked about in much more detail. Uh, and I'm always adding more. So I encourage you to check it out if you want more details about anything I discussed. And here's my contact info. Uh, and I will be joining the face-to-face -face session after this, but I think we might have time for a few questions. Yeah, and we do have a, a few questions here. Um, first one is uh, that you mentioned using exec for a fast shutdown. Uh, they mentioned that they've used uh, dash dash init. Are there any issues with that? Um, those are somewhat orthogonal. Uh, that is, you need to do you need to do all of them. Uh, dash or dash dash init will start uh, a init process, which is necessary to reap sub processes in some cases and make sure you don't have zombie processes. In certain configurations, depending on what init script is used, that will also do the signal handling for you. I don't know if Docker does it by default. Um, and so if you do use the teeny init script and you, I think you use the, maybe the minus G flag, then um, yes, that obviates the need for the other things. Um, the handling signals correctly is a pain. Uh, the thing about dash dash init is that it's Docker, specific to Docker run. And so like if you're using Kubernetes, like you have to use the Kubernetes config file. Um, so I like having the init's a process and optionally other signal handling stuff in the Docker image itself so they don't have to worry about telling people if you're in Kubernetes, you have to do this flag. And if you're in Docker Compose, you have to do this flag. It's just in the image itself. Uh, but yes, you can use Docker run dash dash in it and that solves some of the signal handling problems. All right. Uh, next one is, does Python fault handler uh, slow anything down? Or are there any drawbacks? Uh, it sets a signal handler on segfault, um, on the seg, on sig seg v. Um, so uh, you, unless you're doing something that involves calling uh, sig seg v a lot, signal a lot, which basically no one does, uh, it should have no performance impact. I think the reason it's not on by default is because it might have some uh, sort of operational side effects, but it, it says it's not a performance thing. Uh, Really, it should be on by default, uh, like 99% of the time. It isn't, so you should set it, but yeah, you should just do it. All right. Uh, last one. It's a little bit of a long one. Um, 
for user management with Docker, if you set your image to run as a user, how can another user use that same image and not have issues with file permissions? Uh, thinking more about packaging up from uh, up a library for running a pipeline where users would mount volumes in the container. If you set a user, then that image is not portable. Uh, is there a way to dynamically map host users to Docker users? Yeah, so if you are in a situation where you're running a batch job, uh, you might not want to do it this way. The, the, there's two ways to configure how you running as a non-root user. One is within the image itself, as I did in my example. The other is when you run it, you can say run as this user ID, in which case you'd want it uh, to match in this example you're giving as the current user. Um, so in the case of the batch process, you probably would want to use the second mechanism uh, where you're doing, for example, Docker run dash dash UID and then the ID of the current user uh, and not set it within the image itself. Um, some of the, it, depending whether you're doing a web application or a batch process, so depending on your runtime environment, some best, best practices may or may not apply. Um, uh, so yeah, the, in, in that situation, you do not want to set it within the image process probably. Thank you